Okay. I'm gonna go sledding afterwards if you wanna join. Yeah? Yeah, you're at camera. Kids, Sorry? You're gonna make your kids? Yeah. Oh, well, that's not, yeah, not me. <laughs> I'm to stay home and sleep. I'm gonna go after the her. I think my daughters are gonna go now around like 1, 1.15. I'm gonna take my boys like 1.45. You'd like to throw that camera park, you know? Probably. Yeah. Cause it's pretty crowded at this time, though. Yeah. Where do you normally go? Hmm? Where do you normally go? Oh, you don't go sledding or anything? Like when I'm with my cousins. Oh, nice, nice. That's cool. You go to the pool. It might be a little cold for it. Yeah, I know, I know. That's cool. Let's begin. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, Rikata. All right, guys, we got some things to cover today. I'm going to try to speed it up a little. I'm going to try to finish uh, Khabib time before Ramadan starts. So we had spoken about... So there's, there's, there's one really big... Um, uh, obstacle Khabib faces now at the end of chapter 7. You know, this entire time while he was studying and he had gone uh, into the city with his father, uh, Dagestan Turkish College, where everyone was studying and he was studying in 7th grade, uh, in 8th grade, excuse, in seventh grade, excuse me, 8th grade, 8th grade. Um, Khabib really began to struggle with his schoolwork. And if you remember from last week, um, it was all because, it was last week or the week before? We took last week off, right, because I was working, yeah. Um, it was all because of the fact that his English was uh, a bit poor. And so he eventually failed. And he failed his final exams. And his father had to figure out what he's going to do with his son because he brought all of his wrestlers and his, his, uh, his athletes with him here to study. And he was hoping his son would also make it uh, sort of big time into, into the, the schools that were nearby there. But it didn't work out. So he was sent to secondary school number 38. And what's very important, he was sent to seventh grade, not eighth grade. Now, since he started school at five, um, he had been studying, he was, a year, he was a year advanced. A lot of like Muslim schools and places overseas, they're not as strict with uh, age as we are over here. What's the cutoff here to like, make it to a grade? Yeah, like, like, like September 1st, you have to be born at the first September. If not, you're in the next year's grade or something. Can't remember. I know my son was born early October the 6th. He, he's... He's in the same grade as his cousin, who's a year younger than him. But she's, uh, she met the cutoff. Actually, she didn't meet the cutoff, but she goes to a Muslim school, so they sort of let her in. I don't know how actually that worked out. He goes to a Muslim school too, but they're a little more strict where he goes. Anyway, anyway. So Khabib, he actually, when he fails, um, he mentions that, I joined the seventh grade, not the eighth grade, as you, read, dear reader, might have thought. But then he mentions something very interesting. Um, that ever since he was five, he's been studying with people a year older than him, and now everything fell into its proper place. I began to study with my peers. There's a really important idea over here, and that is having uh, everything in its appropriate place. In Arabic, there's a word called vul. Vul means oppression. And oppression in the Arabic language specifically refers to putting something outside of its proper place. And sometimes when we do these small things, especially as parents, like, oh, I'm going to have my child be a year, year advanced and put them ahead by starting school a little earlier, 
or, or pushing the school to put them in first grade instead of kindergarten, it might seem okay. But statistics now show, uh, and I'm saying this as an educator, that students who are in their proper grade, they're the ones who advance more, long longitudinally. Because they don't feel as pressured, they're not smaller, so they don't physically feel out of place, they're more socially in tune, they're more, everything is more in tune with what it's supposed to be. So Khabib over here, he fell into his proper place. So now how does it affect you guys as youth? Well, as youth, sometimes I see people who are good at basketball. Like, are you a freshman or your eighth grader? Freshman. freshman, okay. So freshman, you go to East, right? Are you on the basketball team? Nice. What, what team are you on? Freshman team, or JV team, or varsity team? Sorry? So, so I see some freshmen who are good at ball. You're good at ball. And so they, they, they say things like, well, I, I want to be on JV as a freshman. It doesn't hurt. You have like these stars like LeBron James kid who as a freshman probably play on the varsity team. But aside from those individuals, in general, it's best to fit in with your own grade, with your own class, with your own um, age group. And the reason is because life, <clears throat> eventually you get thrown to the wolves. I work with people older than me, younger than me, etc. But at this age when you're developing, the most uh, benefit comes with being with people who are like-minded and like body. And some people, they try to get ahead of themselves, but Allah, He doesn't allow the fruit to come out in winter. It only gets ripe and comes out in spring. Allah doesn't let the snow fall in the summer. It only falls in the winter. Things have their proper and appropriate time. And Khabib, this point is interesting because he notices this. And he says, now everything fell into its proper place. I began to study with my peers. And now everything began to flow much better. And eventually, his father is able to, uh, to advance his coaching career. His uh, friends who are now competing, they're able to, uh, to, 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 to train much better. And he himself is able to learn. And now his father's career is beginning to, turn, uh, to take off. So go to chapter 8 now. The chapter 8 title, We Love to Fool Around, is indicative of any adolescent uh, child. That's what I mean. We love to fool around and we could do so. There's nothing too scary and too much for a child. There is one but. This is the borderline between to fool around and to mess things up. You may not immediately realize this limit, but once having become aware of it, you are afraid to cross it again. Meaning what? All of us know what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And this is like the small line in between that you sort of teeter on. So for example, Taraweeh prayer. Where do you pray Taraweeh prayer? You pray here? Okay, cool. So it's not the same here as it used to be. Over here, when they used to have Taraweeh prayer when I was younger, and I used to come sometimes like Shabina and stuff like that in, the, in Ramadan, there weren't as many people here. And so the kids used to, and this wasn't like this big. There's an office here, etc. Uh, the kids used to fool around quite a bit. They used to do things outside, etc. But you knew the line that you couldn't cross. Like if you were outside and you were... Um, you know, just hanging out in the parking lot. Like, okay, fine, you shouldn't be, you should be inside praying, but that was fine. Well, in the moment one kid began to throw rocks, just like in the parking lot, hit someone's window and it breaks, now you know that's the line we weren't supposed to cross. Once you cross it, realize you should never do it again. Like, I'm thinking of a few things I've done when I was younger, which I'm not going to share because I heard this thing actually was recorded, um, that I realized later, okay, that's the line I'm never crossing again. And this is where mistakes are important. One of the knocks against Khabib as an actual athlete and a competitor within, uh, within um, mixed martial arts is he never lost. And if you never face adversity, you never lose, and you never know how good you need to become. Which maybe if he went further in life uh, in, in, this, uh, in this field, he would have recognized it. Um, but it never came in his professional field. But here, when he was younger, he mentions that they had a few opportunities to do pranks. And... Um, though there were only a few opportunities, um, they still found opportunities. And kids always know how to fool around, not in a bad way, just to hang out, just to make a good time out of nothing. Sometimes I'll see, like, you know, my kids, they'll just be sitting there, they're bored, they're bored. Eventually, when they realize they're not going to get some screen time, they're not going to be able to hang uh, out with friends, they just make something up and they begin to play with it. And sometimes it's distractive, sometimes it's disruptive, and sometimes it's just fun to watch. So he said, we used to go to the river without our parents' knowledge and driving the cattle home in the evening, we would slip away into the street again. I like to be creative in these things. Moving to Makachkala increased the possibility of fooling around. Here I understood the width and depth of possible maneuvers. Immediately after the move, I plunged into a completely unknown world of big streets, tall buildings, cars constantly rushing somewhere or another, and of course, different people. 
father always stood in the path of my desire to mess around. To him, I was already an adult, and it manifests in almost everything. Islamically, what is the age of adulthood? Yeah, when you reach puberty, that's it. You reach puberty, you're an adult. Now there's understanding that he's a young adult versus an older adult. But that's when you become an adult. That's when you're held accountable. Prayers you're held accountable for, fasting you're held accountable for, zakat technically you're held accountable for, etc. And it's funny, sometimes parents, we forget what it meant to, like I look at my older son, who's 15, like, he's an adult in my eyes. I forget what it was at 15 to uh, be a kid. I'm not, I haven't been there for 25 years. I have no idea. What, I, I, I've distanced myself from that feeling, unfortunately. And so Khabib, his dad is looking at him like, okay, you're, you're a man, you're going physical stature like a man, maybe going facial hair, you're a man, that's it. We're leaving you, to, we're treating you like a man. And for the children who just become men or women, they're thinking to themselves, like, I'm still a kid. And so he was trying to avoid his father's discipline and he's trying to do what he wanted to do at the same time um, he would get punished. And he mentioned if you balked at what was expected of you, you got additional tasks around the house. Meaning what? You're expected to do certain things. And the, traditionally, the elder person is always right in a disagreement. So if you do something that they don't like, you're going to get in trouble. And what's the, what's the discipline over here? You get more things to do around the house. So he says, I was third lowest in rank of seniority. That is, only two people were younger than me. And at any moment, each of the six or eight older brothers could give me an order, which I was obliged to fulfill. Not older blood brothers, but those who were staying in the house together. Um, and so he said, I had three obstacles in life. If I could get past those, I would be free. Father's control, the schoolwork itself, and household chores. And so he's like, I could figure out very easily how to get around all these things. I knew very quickly what I needed to do to get, uh, bypass my father, sidestep uh, my, my household chores, and whatever for school needs to be done, needs to be done. And as a result, at this time, things got sort of weird between him and his dad. Now he's 8th grade, ninth grade right now, so he's like 13, 14 years old. And he said, I understood how to behave better in order first to please him, and secondly to be able to slip away more often about my own business. I learned how to present information in ways that they were in my own best interest and change the conversation and topics convenient for me. Meaning what? He learned not to lie, but to make himself always look good. And he said, back then I thought this was a great achievement, but now I understand everything differently. I realize how disobedient I was, etc. So this is a really important point. You know, it's really hard to be a different age group from someone. You, people who are younger, they know how this feels. They know how it feels to come to the masjid and to be judged just for being young. To what someone calls them out for not praying properly. Someone calls them out for, you know, being in the back fooling around. They could be eight uncles in the shoe area checking the text messages. But the kid in the back, who took a little longer to join the jama'ah, is usually called out first. It's unfortunate, but it's just a reality. And so, Khabib, he said that I figured out how to sidestep things and how to make myself uh, get away with things much more. But I realized later in life that I was only hard, uh, harming myself. It's really hard for me, and I know I'm saying really hard a few times here, but it is, it's just difficult for me to figure out how to solve this. This is a crisis that we all face. When you reach a certain age, you forget what it means to be that age. When you reach a certain point in life, you forget what it means to be in that previous point in life. And for younger people, for children, for young, adoles young adults, adolescents, for them it's hard to visualize what it means to be the adult in the room. Like why does he have to be so strict? Why does he have to be so harsh? Why is he always calling me out, or she, I'm just talking from a male perspective over here. And so uh, for Habib, he said that, um, my father did not take his eyes off me for a day. Studies, training, additional classes and individual subjects, of course, I did not understand then why I needed all of this. For example, for some time, my school day began at 7 a.m. with a visit for home study with one of my teachers in Russian language and literature. 7 o'clock in the morning, can you imagine it, dear reader? And I could not be late or worse, escape going. Father was all ready to punish me. Honestly, I did not understand why I needed these classes, but I attended them because father demanded it. He did not have just one reason to cuff me. After a lesson at school one day, the teacher asked me to stay behind. It turned out that she had noticed the redness on my neck and decided to ask what it was. What is this? What's wrong with your neck? She asked me. I did not have time to reply before she asked, is it because of your father? And then I thought, why not? Yes, I replied. 
She immediately called father and asked him not to punish me so severely for my difficulties in studying. Father, of course, lost his temper because of his phone call, as he was not aware of the whole, as, of the whole story. What had actually happened was that the redness on my neck had been caused by a kimono jacket constantly rubbing against my neck when fighting and training. This simple ruse helped me rid myself of my teacher's annoying habit of calling father complaints. The scheme with my neck worked for a year almost flawlessly, etc., etc. So he does the same things that we do. He's trying to take advantage of his situation to make his situation better. But at the same time, he realizes later that it wasn't worth it. Like, I only lost out in discipline and, and becoming better. And I know that youth sometimes get sick of hearing, like, well, when I was your age, if only I knew now, when I, then when I knew now. But if, have you ever heard that, like, adults saying, oh, if only I knew that when I was your age? You hear that a few times? Have you ever thought, like, man, stop saying it? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I hate it when people said that. But now I'm thinking, like, I should have thought, like, if, like, 10, 15 people are saying that, or 5, 6 people are saying that, maybe there's some truth to it. So what Khabib is really trying to highlight over here is this idea of how, you know, if, if the general masses are benefiting from something, or they have some idea regarding something, etc., we should recognize that there's good in it. And it's really important for people to look across the aisle and see, wow, like the other side is sort of suffering or going through this. I should put myself in that person's shoes, i.e. empathy. And so Habib, in this, um, in, in, in this situation, he sort of gl gives a glimpse of himself as a child. He was a bit mischievous. But at the same time, he recognizes later the, the importance of what his dad was pushing him to do. Now, let's just move forward a little because there's a lot more to go on. I will tell you, dear reader, one more story. In the summer, we used to run to the seaside in the morning. On these distance runs, we crossed almost the entire city from the mountains behind down the streets. I always liked running. It allowed me to be alone with myself, which means a lot. Having arrived at the sea, we used to train. Circuit training, which is the base of Father's training methods, was waiting for us on the shore. For all our efforts, Father gave each of us some money for lemonade a role, etc. However, we brothers found that it, what, what was, in our opinion, a better use was cash. On receiving our money, we immediately rushed back home. However, we had no strength to run back, especially as we had to go up streets sloping up uh, towards the mountain behind the city. So we turned home by public minibus. If you read, dear reader, think what we used the money our Father gave us for, on our workouts to pay for the ride back, then you are mistaken. Money had a different purpose, more valued purpose. And then what was that? You would see over here. Um, okay, and this dad gets really upset over here. Um, so pretty much they would go use the computer rooms and computer games. They used all their money. And what would happen was um, they'd go on the bus. And then they'd get on the bus and they would say, um, there'd be a whole group that gets on. The driver was, the, uh, and then each one would say, oh, the last guy's going to pay for us. The last guy will pay for us. The last guy, because there's a whole group coming on. So they're all, all getting on um, and no one pays. And so, so can you imagine this? You're on one side of the city, you have to run to the other side of the city. That's your training. You don't run through the streets, you run through the mountains. So you're running up the hill, downhill, uphill, downhill. That's your training. They, they get to the seashore. They're working out over there, circuit training. Circuit training is tough. It really drains you. Now dad gives them money. Here's some, you can get money for lemonade and some rolls to eat. They take that money, they don't eat with it. And instead of walking or running back, they take the bus back. When they get on the bus, they always say, hey, last guy's gonna pay for it, don't worry about it. And then the driver would just be waiting and no one pays. And so eventually, uh, they, um, uh, the, the dad always, he, father always finds out. And he became angry because he gave the money. Um, and on top of that, he stopped giving allowance. And then on top of that, it was enough for us to travel by public transport in case of urgent need. Like, you should be in shape enough to come back. But then what really upset him was like, what were you doing with the money? They were going to his computer rooms. Basically, you won't remember this because you're too young. I remember this, and those who went overseas and studied, they remember this, that overseas you had like these like internet cafes, and like these computer rooms and these game rooms. And basically there was like this storefront or in the mall there'd be like a store where you'd come in, there'd be a bunch of computers, you'd go give money, they'd let you use it for a period of time. And these guys just when they, they, they played games um, the entire time, and um, and so uh, their father like punished him severely, and he um, he he really called him out, 
and there's an interesting conversation over here. In the club, says in the football field, we felt, uh, we felt we were masters of the situation. We went there with our brothers. Jean and I used to go with Abu Bakr together, and we looked for computers which were free. If there was none, we would like we saw a likely victim of circumstance. It would go like this: a boy would be quietly praying, playing. Abu Bakr would come up and ask, "How long are you going to play for?" An hour. The boy would reply. So then Abu Bakr would say, "Let me fight you. Let me do one fight, will you?" So the boy says, "Sure. You know, you can play one game. No problem." One fight the computer would merge smoothly into another, into a third, into a fourth. The boy would say, enough, give me the joystick back, and would re- receive a slap from Abu Bakr with words, your time is up, the game is over. And so what's really, so on, on, on the bus, they were doing this, to kids in the game room, what do they become? These guys, what do they become? Yeah, like bullies, like, like they were those guys, they were hooligans, like they were, from being these good guys who lived in the mountains, whose parents were in the mountain regions, who moved to the farming district, who were simple, who would train, etc. Now they became these individuals who, they, they were those guys, like you know those guys in school, right? The ones like everyone avoids, the one you hate being around, the one that you're sort of afraid of at the same time, who might take your lunch money, and that doesn't really happen anymore, but you know, like, you know my point. But that's what they became. Now, they became that under their father, or father the coach. And so, Echavi even mentions, I certainly do not claim that, this was, that all this was good. Of course it was not. For these little tricks, I'm now ashamed and uncomfortable in front of all those people. However, I'm sharing this with you. Back then, we thought this was all a matter of course. Meaning, at that point, he thought that this was like common. This is okay. But looking back at it, how embarrassed he is in front of these individuals. Similarly for us, sometimes when we're making these decisions, we don't recognize I'm really messing someone up. I'm really hurting someone else. And I'm completely ruining my own reputation and making myself someone who's unsavory. Look, if you come here to the masjid and every time like I, um, uh, like, I, mean, I can't use the masjid as an example. Let's use a different example. Okay, let's say uh, after Juma we go out to eat. You know, we hit up like, I don't know, Fahrenheit or something. And we go, and you always join. Let's say I always join. I want to use you. I always join. I'm like, hey, guys, what's up? And I sit down. And I'm like, hey, what are you guys doing? like, oh, we're eating. And why don't you join us? I'm like, no, nah, I'm good, man. I'll just sit and hang out. And then I come, and you're having onion rings. I take a couple onion rings. And someone's having the fries. I take a few fries. Someone's having cheese sticks. I'm taking a few cheese sticks. And what's happening now is I'm taking, like, little from everyone. How does that feel? It's like, dude, get your own food. Yeah, I did it once, whatever. Next week, I come and do the same thing. Next week, I come and actually order. And I'm like, oh, guys, dude, I totally forgot my wallet. My bad, dude. And then, um, uh, and then it's like, okay, fine, fine, we'll cover you. Next week, I come and I'm like, guys, I got this. It's totally on me. And then I tell the guy at the register, I got this. And now surprise, it's on me. And then you all eat. And then I just slip out before anyone can pay. Before I can pay, at least. Eventually, I'm going to be that guy. Like, you know what it means to be that guy. You know, the guy who comes... Um, you know, we go to the pool, like we, and then we're all waiting to jump off the diving board. I'm like, hey, dude, can I just go ahead of you? Come on, I just got here. You're like, okay, fine, fine, come on. Then again, I'm like, hey, dude, can I, can I get ahead of you? It's like, dude, why are you so annoying? Like, it's not all about you. And this is what's happening over here. They became that guy. And for Khabib's father, that really bothered him because um, he, was, um, he was trying to train not athletes, not stars. He's trying to train men trying to make these young men into people who the society would be proud of, he would be proud of, Allah would be happy with, and people who would be uh, like examples for others. But at the same time, and um, um, the, it just it backfired. So he became very upset. There's another example. We decided to go for a ride in a car, an old car, the model which in Russia was called Kopeka. There were a lot of us that immediately realized that we might not all fit. However, this initially presented no obstacle. We all tried to squeeze in, but it became clear that there was not room for everyone. We then took a crazy decision. I got out of the car, walked around it, climbed into the trunk, laying my stomach on the rear window, leaning over the roof, and grabbed the car window frames on both sides, prudently opened by my comrades. Another of, uh, of us did the same thing, but on the other side, on the front windshield. Imagine the picture, an old Kopeka, old car full of boys, one in the front end, one in the front mirror, one in the back mirror, with broken metal clips hanging down from the mud floor, beating against the asphalt along the streets. Of course we did not go unnoticed. Some passerbys laughed and applauded our inventiveness while the others in bewilderment walked away. 
We attracted everyone's attention, including the, that of police officers on the, du- on the duty nearby. They rushed after us. The owner of the car, who was sitting in the passenger seat at that time, urged our driver to press down the accelerator and in no case to slow down the turns. And then, um, and he says, remember, dear reader, I was not inside the vehicle. I was thrown from the side to, to so, uh, thrown side to side so I could fly off at any moment. However, our driver did not slow down. Soon the two cars were chasing us, then three, then four, and at full speed we hit a speed bump. The adventure cost us a torn, a torn out camshaft and a sudden stop. We rushed to Skada, but we were blocked. The police began to round up our boys. In the end, we managed to get away with it, explaining most eloquently to the officers that we did not understand, had no desire to, did not mean anything at all. Every incident they did, it built upon the other. And this is, you know, the title of this, if you remember again, it just, what was the title? Do you remember what it was? It was just messing around, right? We love to fool around. It starts off from something small, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Now they're bullying people. Now they're using their money incorrectly. Now they're stiffing the bus driver. Now they're doing what they did at the computer game store. Now they're causing almost an accident on the road. Now they're running from the cops. It all grew bigger. And for Habib's father, he, it bothered him a lot because he didn't want them to become reckless. And this is from ages 12 to 15 for Habib. Um, and while you look back, like even I look back at college with a smile, at the same time as the, you look at what happens, you have to note that in the end, if you don't fix things early, it gets worse. And as young men, this is you all, and women as well, you have to all understand this, is that you have to set limits early about fooling around. I know no one wants to be that guy who always does a buzzkill and ruins everything, but if you go and you push the boundaries one day, then that boundary will look normal the next day. Then you push the boundaries the next day, now th- that boundary looks more normal. The next boundary you push, now five, six, seven days later, five, six, seven weeks later, you're doing things you never have imagined, and what you would never have imagined in the first place became normal place. That's how drugs become common, that, that's how dating and zina becomes common. These things all happen because a person pushes the line initially and doesn't realize how far they're going overall. Cool. So we finish all of chapter, the rest of chapter 7 and all of chapter 8. I told you I'm going to speed up a little. I want to finish before Ramadan, inshallah. So next week I'm going to try to do 9, 10, and 11. Cool? Stop over here. I know there's a program after the Dhar today. Okay. So it's Mufti Harun, right? Alhamdulillah. And, and Ms. Bahadina. Cool. Okay, so those of you listening online, please do come by. The program is about, um, about uh, burial and how to, uh, uh, the, the circumstances and conditions of washing, burying the body, as well as uh, purchasing, uh, pl- uh, preparing for death, and, you know, including purchasing the plots, etc., in preparation for this time. SubhanAllah, bihamdi, subhanakum, alhamdulillah, I think the last two weeks of February, I may not be here. I'm traveling, I think, both. I'm working the last week of February. I think I'm doing a program the second to last week. But that second to last week, the program's in Michigan. It's a, I took a stayover program in the Masjid. So if the youth want to come, then we can arrange a driver. I would normally drive them, but I think this time I'm actually flying there. Normally I drive there. I think this year I'm flying there just because I have to work and I have to go and come back. Um, but... Um, yeah. The second to last week in February, I think the 18th and 19th, 17th, 18th, 19th. Imam Tahir Anwar is coming from California, and I forgot who else is coming. Yeah.